Welcome to lecture thirteen. So so far, we have discussed many models that aim to capture the interaction between agents and the environment. What we look at complete information games, such as the repeated games, where the environment is static and completely known, and global agents who have、uh, repeated interactions.、Um, but there is no dynamics in the environment. We also have Bayesian games where we have a number of agents who are interacting,、uh, but only uh, in uh, a simultaneously and one-off interaction. So essentially, Bayesian game is a, is a static game.、Uh, and then thirdly, we've looked at in the last lecture Markov decision process, where we can have the agent who's engaging in a more complex forms of interaction with the environment uh, and uh, the Uh, basically, that uh, uh, model which allows us to complete the loop, so that from the environment,、uh, the factors in the environment determines the game setup, which influences the decision making of the agent, and then the agent will make actions that, in return, will change the state of the environment correspondingly. So, so this sort of、um, Uh, cycle between so this sort of interacting cycle between the agent and the environment is something that we really want to capture uh, and uh, focus on in artificial intelligence. However, in Markov decision process, this is only a single player game, uh, and uh, obviously one would uh, say uh, that why don't we、uh, define a model which capture all of the factors in the existing models and in general enough. To、uh, enable multiple agents to interact within the、uh, environment. If you recall the definition of Markov decision process for one player,、uh, it's actually quite easy to extend it to a multiple player scenario. And the model called the Markov game.、Um, in the literature, I, th I think a lot of the game theoretical liter literature is calling it the stochastic game. Um, because that was the original name given by Shapley. I do not want to use the acoustic game because the transitions, although we allow probabilistic transitions, it, they don't need to have uncertainty in the model.、Uh, in particular, we could have a model where all of the transitions are deterministic, right? So in this case, the the game doesn't have to be randomized,、uh, and therefore I would just prefer to call it a Markov game. So let's look at the components. It's essentially very similar to a Markov decision process, apart from the fact that、uh, we have multiple players. So that we have a set of players from one to n, and then we have a number of states. We have a number of actions. Recall that、uh, in a multiple uh, agent case, the actions need to be divided into the action of the players, and then the action space will consist of the cross product, the, the the Cartesian product of all of the Uh, actions for the players, and then we have these、uh, transition function, which can be probabilities. Right, so、uh, given a state and an action, and and of course the the state is the state, and the the action could be the com combination of actions、uh, that are performed by all the agents. So this A, which belongs to the capital A, that will be a action profile or a strategy profile, right?、Uh, and、um, the Uh, the, the 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 value of p of s prime given as a that's denoting the transition probability, and I just following the same notation as last lecture, I use capital P with superscript a and subscript s arrow s prime to indicate the probability of this transition going from s to s prime、uh, when the players、uh, adopt actions in a.、Right. So. Uh, that's the transition function, and of course we're going to have the reward functions、so、given s and s prime, which are states, and then the combination of strategies of the players.、Uh, a stage payoff,、uh, which is the R i of s prime given s at a, right? That's the、uh, the the rewards that the agents will get from this particular transition going from s to s prime.、Uh, And、uh, action A, and that is denoted by capital letter R A,、uh, S 
arrow s prime. But then we have an extra subscript of i there. This indicates the reward to agent i. So for for every agent, we're gonna have uh, some of the rewards. So so this basically this r i uh, indicate the reward to agent i, right? Uh, and then also we have the discount factor delta. Right, so that's the uh, definition that we use for Markov game. The game will start with some initial state, and uh, at any stage, the game will be in a particular state as t, right? So we're gonna have the sequence. Uh, so any history of the play of the game will start with s1, s2, and then all the way to s t. Uh, and in every state, the players will actually play a normal form game. So they will just simultaneously choose some action that are available at that state. And then the next state is determined by a combination of the actions in the current state and the probability function. So we essentially the probability function indicates the probability of a transition from the current state to the next state given the action. Uh, and then along with the transition that's been performed, the player will get a reward. So that's distributed to each single agent, right? And of course, the uh, play uh, of the Markov game is uh, almost the same definition as for the Markov decision process. Uh, it just consists of infinite sequence of uh, states, actions, and rewards. So S1, A1, R1, S2, A2, R2, and so on. Right. At any stage t, all the players can observe the entire history, uh, s1 up to st. So what has already happened, we assume that the agents are able to observe it. Um, and um, let's look at this very simple example. We have a typical grid, grid world scenario, but here we have a 2 by 3 grid. Uh, and there are six states, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but we have two agents. Uh, Mario and Bowser, who are starting from their respective locations, namely one and three, and they would like to end up at the position five where the princess is locked up. Uh, and um, whoever that gets there first wins the game. Yeah. So uh, we further put restriction and some more interesting scenario to this example, we assume that Mario states consist of 1, 2, 4, 5, so Mario will not go to 3 and 6, and Bowser state will be 2, 3, 5, 6. Uh, and we also require that these two people will not uh, contain the same uh, space, same cell, right? So every cell can contain at most one agent. And whoever enters cell 5 will win the game and stop the game. So once there's a person who enters the cell 5, then they'll just stop. Uh, but remember, when we're talking about the play, it was assumed to be infinite play. So how can we use an infinite play to model finite run of the game? Well, this is very easy. So whenever we have a finite run, we just... Uh, whenever we reach a state where we think is a terminating state, we just, in the infinite run, we assume that the game just stuck there forever without giving any payoff to the agents. Right. So essentially, it stops the game, but it's just according to the model, it just continuously go on, but nothing happens. Um, so the agent may move from one side to another along the direction of the arrow. So this means that at um, certain places, the agent would not be able to have any choice. For example, if Mario is at uh, cell 4, there's no other choice but to go to 5. And in fact, uh, he would not want to go to any other cell, right? Um, also, Bowser at uh, cell 6, he just want to go left. And uh, if any of them is at cell 2, the only direction is going up. So you can see that the position where uh, an agent can make uh, a choice is at position 1 and position 3. Right. Uh, and uh, also to make the game more interesting, we put a breakable barrier between cell 1 and 4. So that barrier there uh, is breakable. But if an agent chooses to break it, there's a certain chance 
that he will succeed, but there's a certain chance that he will not succeed. And if he doesn't succeed, he just uh, stay at the same cell. So, for example, if Mario wants to go from one to four, he need to go past this barrier, but only with probability two over three. And so, with one third of the chance, he just stay at where he is. And uh, in order to go forward, he still need to try again, right? Uh, and uh, also, there's a fence between. Um, two and five, right? So this means that uh, if the agent starts from the location four two, so this means if Mario is at four and uh, and uh, Bowser is at two or Mario is at two and Bowser is at six, and when they try to move to the position five at the same time, then the agent at position four and six has an advantage, right? So it, this means that uh, three quarter of a chance, the person who will be at position four instead of two will go through to five and win the game. And also similarly, if they are at two and six, then with three quarter of a chance, uh, the uh, the bowser will be able to win the game by moving to five first, right? Um, so, you know, going up to get to four or six uh, has a bit of trouble because this barrier, so there's uncertainty on whether you can actually get past in one go. Um, whereas if you go to position two, um, you will face also a disadvantage if the other player is already uh, at four or six. Uh, if you're trying to get to five from two, uh, essentially the barrier will make you slower, right? So, so it seems like uh, either way there's a problem. And then um, if the agent start at one and three or they start at four and six and they try to move to the same cell, Right, so if, for example, if starting at one and three, well, Mario wants to move right, Bowser wants to move left, and both of them will enter cell two, but at that moment, they need to start a fight. Right, and being much smaller than Bowser, Mario only has two fifths of a chance of winning the fight with Bowser. So Bowser is more powerful when they directly confront with each other. Similarly, if they are at position four or six, right? So so Mario starting at four, Bowser starting at six, and suppose they both want to move to position five at the same time, then uh, they will also enter a fight, and Mario will lose with probability three over five. Right. So <clears throat> that's the sort of the general picture. Picture you can see that even though there are not many states, um, because of the extra stuff that's going on in this environment, there are quite a lot of uncertainty. And um, uh, so we would like to analyze the situation. And first of all, we want to model the situation into a Markov game. So we have to identify the state space. The states are not just one, two, three, four, five, six, because we have two agents. Uh, so we need to use a state to capture the location of both of the agent, right? And uh, of course, for the case of Mario, he could be in any of the positions one, two, four, five. But of course, if it's at five, he wins the game. So let's just assume that his state space is just one, two, four. And similarly for Bowser, the state space is two, three, six. So what we need as the global state of the environment will be just a um, a, two, a, a pair uh, of positions, one for Mario, one for Bowser. So it will be one, two, four multiplied with two, three, six. So to take the Cartesian product of these two sets. And we also designed to have two terminating states, Q1 and Q2, and these are observing states. They, they just uh, specifying the outcome of the game. So Q1 specifies that Mario will be the first person who enters five and wins the game. So Q1 is the state for Mario to win. And Q2 is the state for Bowser to win. So we assume that Mario is uh, player one, Bowser is player two. And uh, then, of course, we have to take out the state 2-2 because 
um, we assume that no uh, cell can contain more than one agent, right? So two, two obviously is eliminated. So altogether we have these um, uh, 11 minus two, so nine states uh, are what we're looking at, right? Um, this, this example is carefully designed so that um, it's still relatively small while showcasing the um, unique characteristic of Markov games, right? So state IJ would indicate that P1 or Mario is at cell I and P2 or Bowser is at cell J. Uh, and the action space for the agents consists of uh, two actions. But in fact, if you look at uh, the scenario, the player actually can only uh, make a decision themselves at the very start, uh, after which they cannot uh, have any say in, you know, what they want to do, right? So uh, action space of uh, the Mario would be to go either right or up, and the action space of Bowser would be either to move left or move up. So now we can define the transition probability and the what stage payoff or the immediate payoffs for the agents uh, we use the single table to capture all of these information the first three columns of the table indicate the from state the action to be taken and the to state right so uh, you can see that um, sometimes at particular action the uh, uh sometimes at particular states there are no option for the player so i'm just using a dot to indicate the transition because the players do not have any options to choose from uh and um then the probability uh are defined according to uh the game scenario uh and then the payoff uh most of the payoff before the player reaches the uh, end game will be zero zero. The only uh, difference is when the player at one three and uh, they want to both of them want to move to position two. Uh, so uh, Mario wants to move right, Bowser wants to move left at you know both of them uh, and suppose they start from positions one and three. Uh, then they enter into this fight, and we know with probability 3 over 5, Mario loses. So we assume that there is a cost to losing. So Mario's payoff will be negative C, and Bowser's payoff will be positive C. And with probability 2 over 5, Mario wins. So Mario's probability will be positive C, and Bowser's uh, payoff will be negative C. So that captures these two rows in the table. Similarly, if both of them starting at, if they start at location four and six respectively, and suppose they want to go to five, of course they would want to go to five according to the the, the arrow on the map, uh, and then they would need to go into a fight. And in this fight, um, well, so so now with probability three over five, Bowser will win, and Bowser will win. But if he wins, he will then occupy the position five, which means he would just win the entire game, right? So that moment, not only Bowser gets a reward of C from the fight, he also gets to win the game. So the payoff will be one plus C. And then uh, Mario correspondingly will lose the game, so he loses the uh, payoff negative one as well as the negative C, which is the payout out of losing the fight. Right. And similarly with uh, probability two over five, Mario will get a payoff one plus C, and Bowser will get a payoff negative one minus C. So you can see that captures the other two rows in this table. And then uh, in any other cases, whoever wins the game will get a payoff one. And whoever loses the game will get a payoff of negative one. So, so this table captures all of the uh, immediate payoffs uh, from the agents, uh, and not uh, well. Actually, I did not uh, show all the uh, transition. All the other transitions have zero zero reward. So I assume that these transitions are trivial transitions. I do not talk about it. Uh, and um, 
Now, uh, once we've defined a, a game model, we will need to um, capture the agent's behaviors using the notion of strategies. Remember, in uh, the markup decision process, when there's only one agent, we, we, we actually, by strategy, we mean policy of the, of the agent. So that means it's given a particular state, the agent would choose what to do from that state. Right. So similarly, we do exactly the same thing here. A strategy pi i of a particular player i is a mapping from uh, histories to actions in A. So, so histories are just sequences of uh, states of the game. But in fact, we essentially only care about um, the strategy which gives rise to a Markov random process. This means that I satisfy the um, the, 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 the Markov property uh, that says the action of the player only depends on the current state but not on any other states in the history. Right? So we can then formally model, uh, define the Markov pure strategy as a function that maps states to actions, namely a function pi i which maps s to a. Uh, and similarly, we can extend that to a Markov behavioral strategy that's in the same way as the, in the Markov decision process case that maps states to distributions over the actions of the player. Right. And given that, this elim eliminates some very interesting strategies that we can look at, namely, if you recall, when we talk about the repeated game situation, we have the grim trigger strategy. That is a strategy which um, do not just rely on the current state of the game, because it says that the agent would just uh, continues to play cooperative action until there's a defect uh, defection uh, from the opponent. At that moment, the player enter a grudge state and then plays um, betrayal always, right? So that is a strategy where the players are playing based on the history of the play, and that is not a Markov strategy. So, uh, you know, of course, in the literature of Markov games, it is very interesting to look at non-Markov strategies, so just arbitrary strategies. But in this course, just to be simple, and because we're only introducing the model for now, we'll keep our life simple by looking only at Markov strategies. So this means the Grim Trigger strategy, when we talk about Markov games, uh, is out of consideration. Right. Uh, and then um, just to finish off the uh, analysis of the strategies similar to Markov decision process, any strategy profiles. So now we're looking at a combination of strategy of all of the players that would generate a probability distribution of plays where the probability of any history uh, uh, occurring is the product of all of the transitions that are that happened within that history. Right? So it's the, the product of all of the transitions, P, S, I, pi, S, I, S, I plus one. Right? So that captures the um, behaviors of the players it's about utility, what about payoffs and so on. So again, I'm using utility to denote essentially long-term uh, summed payoffs. And again, we're looking at discounted payoffs. So we have the discount factor gamma uh, the discounted payoff will be uh, you take the reward plus the gamma discounted of the next reward and plus the gamma squared discounted of the third reward and so on and so forth. So essentially we would like to uh, obtain from any state a valuation which captures the expected payoff for the infinite play uh, for any infinite play, play which is consistent with the strategy pi for a given player i, right? And this is denoted by the v function. You can see that now this resemble very closely to Markov decision process, right? So v i pi is the expectation given the strategy pi of the disc gamma discounted payoff. So with this notion of payoff, for the players, we are able to examine the optimal strategies, namely the um, 
best response of players to other people's uh, strategies. Uh, one thing that we can uh, the the first observation that we can make is that in fact we it, it is reasonable to assume that the player will play a Markov strategy. Uh, the next proposition says that suppose in a Markov game, um, all of the opponents of a player adopt Markov strategies, then. Uh, in actual fact, the, the best response for player I will be to also respond by a Markov strategy. So this means that essentially this is some sort of closure um, that uh, we could just stay within the realm of Markov strategies and analyze the situation where everybody is using a Markov strategy. Uh, and uh, the proof actually uh, doesn't need, we don't need a, a um, formal proof for this proposition. It's more like an observation because once we fix the Markov strategy over all of the other players, then from the perspective of the current player I, uh, what he's facing is simply just like a one-player game. And that one-player game is the same as a Markov decision process. Uh, and therefore, the optimal strategy, we can find it. You know, not only we know that the best response would be a Markov strategy, but also the best response would be uh, the result of the optimal control problem. So that uh, is uh, why we're looking at Markov strategies for now. Uh, and uh, then it's very natural that we can ask uh, the corresponding problems about the strategies here in the context of Markov games. Uh, the first problem is strategy evaluation problem, namely given a Markov uh, game and also strategy profile pi, we want to compute the utilities of the, the, the value function of uh, given pi and for all the players i uh, in this game. So uh, how do we solve this problem? In fact, uh, this can be very, very simple because once we know the Markov strategy, uh, essentially what we get from the point of view of any player i, we just uh, face a normal MDP. And then uh, we can just use the Bellman expectation equation and bootstrapping, so, so dynamic programming will give us the value function that we need, right? So this can be solved in the same way as the policy evaluation for MDP. Uh, now we then look at uh, the control problem. So this would be optimal strategy problem. So uh, we are thinking about you know what would be the good uh, strategy adopted by a player. And uh, like what I said, if you just look at the point of view of a single player, and so suppose you want to solve the single player optimal strategy problem, uh, the goal is to identify an optimal response of player I to the Markov strategy of the opponents. And suppose we fix a Markov strategy profile of the opponents, then the Markov, the optimal Markov strategy of the player I will be the result of the optimal control problem. And this can be solved by either policy iteration or value iteration uh, in exactly the same way as MDP. Right? Uh, so that uh, wouldn't be so much of an issue here. So there's everything just naturally carries over to this case. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the game that I've just defined, we have the uh, two player uh, who are interacting in this uh, grid-like um, world. The Markov strategy specifies the player's movement at every state. Uh, for Mario, we know that the action space consists of either moving up or moving right. For Bowser, the uh, strategy consists of either to move left or move up. So notice that the decision only matter at the location one three. That's, that's, that's the sort of the assumed initial uh, positions of the players. Uh, and whenever any player move out of that initial player, then the player will not have any chance to uh, make any, you know, any further decisions. It just follows the direction uh, of the game. Um, so we can specify essentially only four Markov strategies here. Um, for the player, uh, so for Mario, it's uh, you know, right up for both or left up. So any combination of that at this location one and three, that will be one Markov 
strategy. So now we can try to evaluate each of these Markov strategies. We start from the fir first one, where uh, starting from the positions one and three, the agent chooses to uh, move right and left. So this means that um, Mario wants to move from position one to two, and Bowser wants to move from position um, from position three to two. Right. So this uh, creates a conflict between Mario and Bowser, uh, as they both want to enter the same cell, uh, so they have to enter this fight. And recall that we said that whenever these two people meet, they will. Um, there's a probability that uh, with sixty percent chance, Mario will lose. So with sixty percent chance, Mario will lose, and uh, Bowser will move to location two while Mario stays at location one. And, and the outcome of that will give Mario a negative uh, reward of negative th three, uh, negative C, right? So, so we here in this line, we are capturing the payoff to Mario. So this is for the first player. Uh, so we got, so Mario going to get negative C if he loses. Uh, and not only that, uh, when Mario stays at position one and Bowser stays at position two, if you think about the next uh, iteration, Bowser would obviously move to position five, which is a winning location. Uh, so this means that not only Mario loses this conflict, Mario also loses the entire game. And this means that Bowser will get uh, C as a reward, and also uh, one for the next iteration. But when they because one is for the next iteration, we have a discount gamma, right? So the payoff to Mario will be negative three, negative C minus gamma, right? That's the payoff once Mario loses to Bowser. And now let's look at the payoff that Mario wins. Uh, Bowser, and that's uh, having a probability of 40%, 2 over 5. And then the corresponding uh, reward that Mario will get would be C for this round and 1 for the next round. So that means it's C plus gamma. So altogether, we got 1 over 5 multiply negative C minus gamma. And that's the um, reward expected uh, payoff to Mario uh, for this strategy profile RL, right? So now let's look at the second strategy profile, uh, starting from 1-3, assume that the player is choosing U and L. So this means that Mario moves up and Bowser moves left. So Mario tries to go through this breakable barrier and uh, Bowser just directly moves left to position 2. So how would the uh, payoff look like? Well, we know that in this case, um, with probability 2 over 3, Mario can go through the barrier, right? Uh, and so with probability 1 over 3, Mario will not go through the barrier. And if Mario does not go through the barrier, Bowser starting at position 2 in the next round, it will move to position 5 and wins the game. So the payoff to Bowser will be 1, but then discounted, it will be gamma. So the Mario in this scenario will lose gamma. Right, so we have 1 over 3 multiplied by negative gamma. That's the expectation uh, for Mario uh, once he does not enter, uh, well, go through the breakable barrier. But then with probability 2 over 3, he actually goes to uh, the breakable barrier. Uh, and at that moment, uh, the players will be locating at position 4 and 2. Right, location 4 and 2. Right. And this means that uh, the next iteration, both of them will try to uh, reach location 5. Right. But because of the assumption that there is uh, also some barrier here, and if the two players starting from 1 from 4 and 1 from 2, with probability 3 over 4, the uh, first person who get a 5 will be this person. This person at level uh, at position four, and with probability one over four, uh, Bowser will be able to get to five earlier 
than Mario. So we actually get two outcomes here, uh, one with probability one over four and one with probability three over four. And actually with the, the higher payoff is when Mario actually wins the game and then the uh, payoff will be one. So the discounted value will be gamma. And then with the other probability one over four, we got a negative uh, uh, payoff of gamma. So altogether we have two over three multiply by three over four times gamma minus one over four times gamma. Right? So if you if you calculate that, this will actually equal to zero. Right? So this is the outcome when both of the players ad adopt um, this strategy profile UL. So now let's go to the third case, uh, the strategy profile RU. So in this case, player one, say Mario, will choose to move right and enter position two, while Bowser would choose to move up to enter position six. Right. So in this case, we know that with probability two over three, uh, Bowser would not go through the breakable barrier. Right, because he uh, will find more difficulty in going through the barrier than Mario does. Uh, and therefore, uh, with 2 over 3 probability, Mario will eventually win the game. So that gives us the expected payoff 2 over 3 times gamma. But uh, then with probability 1 over 3, Bowser will not go through the breakable barrier. Uh, we'll, we'll go through the breakable barrier, and at that moment, Bowser will occupy position six, uh, while um, Mario will occupy position two, and both of them wants to enter position five. And at that moment, we know that Bowser has a chance of three over four of actually winning the game. And this means that we multiply three over four with one over three, and then we get one over four uh, probability uh, of actually both are winning the game. And when uh, he does that, the payoff to Mario will be negative one. So the, after discount, we get uh, negative gamma. So we have one over four multiplied with gamma. So that's we, we take away that amount from the expected payoff. But then the other cases when uh, Mario actually goes to position five before Bowser, and the probability of that is one over four, but of course you times one over four with one over three to get one over 12, uh, and the corresponding payoff will be gamma. So you have uh, a plus of one over 12 times gamma. So altogether you've got gamma divided by two for this case, right? That's the payoff to Mario. Now the lastly, we have the case when both of the player chooses to move up. And at that moment, this is uh, a bit tricky uh, because both of the players are faced in the breakable barrier. And this means that we have four possible outcomes. Either both of them go through or one of them goes through, the other doesn't, or both of them cannot go through, right? Uh, and then uh, we want to analyze the four, the, these four situations separately. So there are uh, some simple cases. First of all, uh, if one of them goes through and the other one doesn't go through, Right. So this means that with probability uh, 2 over 3, Mario goes through, and Bowser has probability of 2 over 3, which does not go through, then altogether this outcome will have probability 4 over 3. Right. Oh, sorry, 4 over 9. Uh, and then the corresponding reward for Mario will be gamma. Then this is why we have a term of 4 over 9 times gamma. And then we also have the case when Mario does not go through, but Bowser goes through. But of course, this case will happen with probability 1 over 9. And therefore, we got to have this term of negative 1 over 9 gamma. So this, this settles the cases when uh, one of them uh, does go through and the other doesn't. So uh, then there's another case when um, both of them actually uh, go through. Right, both of them. When when both of them go through, actually the 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 probability of uh, of uh, Mario is two over three, and the probability of for Bowser is one over three. So we've got two over nine chance that this actually happens. And when this happens, then they have to go into this fight, right? So the both of them want to get to position five. And when they get into this fight, then the outcome of the fight de uh, is determined by this probability distribution, namely two over five for a win for Mario and three over five for a win of Bowser. So we've got um, 
essentially two over nine, which is the probability that four six is the next state, multiply with two over five, and that's the probability that Mario actually wins the game. And notice that when he wins the game, he will not only get uh, the uh, winning the, the 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 reward from winning, but also the reward from winning the fight, which is C. And of course, this should be discounted by gamma. So altogether, we've got a positive four divided by forty five. So this is two over nine times uh, two over five, right? So so that's the probability, and then we multiply with the uh, payoff, which is gamma plus gamma C. And then the other cases, of course, when uh, Mario loses the fight, and that happens with a probability of 3 over 5. So multiply with 2 over 9, we've got 6 over 45. And then the loss to Mario will also be gamma plus gamma C. So we have a negative of 9 over 45 times gamma plus gamma C. The more tricky case is when both of them stay at where they are, and it seems like the game did not change. And this actually happened with the probability of 1 over 3 multiplied with 2 over 3. So that happens with the probability of 2 over 9. Uh, but then when this happened, uh, the payoff, uh, essentially we just get the exact um, payoff because that seems like the game has just restarted, but that payoff value should be multiplied by gamma because that uh, we, we've restarted in the next stage, right? So we've got 2 over 9 times gamma times whatever this value is. So we got this equation, v1 gamma, v1 pi of 1, 3 is equal to 2 over 9 gamma times v1 pi of 1, 3, and then plus whatever that uh, sum is. And then we can rearrange this equation to solve for what value of v1 pi actually is, and it gives us this value. So 13 gamma minus 2c gamma divided by 45 minus 10 gamma. So uh, with this, and of course realizing that this game is in fact a zero-sum game, the wind of Mary as a loss of um, Boser. So the um, Boser's uh, payoff would just be the negation of Mario's payoff. And we can use that to construct a payoff matrix. Right? This payoff matrix are the uh, values of the players, uh, and th these are the expected payoff of the players uh, before the game starts. Right? So when we analyze the situation, we can see that from this table, we got a unique Nash equilibrium, namely uh, the strategy UL. So this corresponds to the strategy when Mario moves up and Bolzer moves left, right? And this is very reasonable because for Mario, if he tries to move right, he's facing the uncertainty uh, of uh engaging in a fight with Bowser where he's actually at a disadvantaged position. Or uh, it may be that Bowser actually move up, uh, but then still Mario will get a disadvantaged position. So, uh, And because he has a relatively higher chance of uh, passing through the breakable area, so this seems like a more advantage in his um, action for him. Uh, for Bowser, uh, of course, uh, going through the barrier is a lot difficult, a lot more difficult than for Mario. Uh, and uh, winning the fight actually has a bit more favor to him, uh, and therefore he, uh, it's a it's a it's a better thing if he actually adopts um, the strategy where he can move left and and then go from there, right? So in this case, the uh, that's the sort of the predicted behavior and the sort of the optimal control of both players in this game. Uh, you can see that this is uh, essentially um, very s similar to the analysis of MDP, um, but it's an analysis of uh, the situation considering the action of both of the player, not just a single player. Okay. Uh, with, this with this example, we can now define the next uh, solution concept. So remember, for any of the model, we typically um, make a, a corresponding definition for the solution concept, and that's how we predict the game will be played. And uh, whenever in a dynamic situation, a dynamic game like an extensive form game, a repeated game, uh, we actually are caring about the situation where the players are adopting sequential rationality. So uh, this means that SPE is something that we would like to um, study. Uh, but uh, when uh, this happens, and also when we consider this case that we're facing a Markov game and the players adopting Markov strategies, then the 
corresponding SPE will in fact be MPE. So this is actually correspond to uh, any SPE where the agents are actually adopting Markov strategies, right? So formally, a strategy profile is a Markov perfect equilibrium or MPE if each the each of the strategies to the players in the game is a Markov strategy. And also for every state, the uh, basically the 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 corresponding um, strategy starting from that state is a Nash equilibrium of the game if it starts from S. So, so basically, the second condition uh, is similar to the subgame perfect equilibrium condition. It says that for any subgame, uh, that uh, corresponding strategy profile restricted to that subgame will be um, you know best response for everybody. Right. Uh, and, and that's exactly captured by the second condition. The the only difference between Markov perfect equilibrium and subgame perfect equilibrium is that uh, we require that the strategy of the agents to be Markov. Right. So in the example above, the strategy that specifies uh, player one to move up and player two to move left is a Markov perfect equilibrium. Right. So now the question is, well, um, is it necessarily true that in any Markov game, there's going to be an MPE? And the nice thing is that we can actually guarantee this. So the existence of MPE is uh, guaranteed, and this way it shows that it actually makes a lot of sense to study MPEs in these type of games. Uh, suppose we have an in-player Markov game with a finite state space and finite action space. And now I'm just looking at this very simple case. And there must be a strategy profile that is MPE. So notice that when we talk about MPE, in the past I'm just only talking about pure strategies and the pure strategy profiles, but uh, we actually have in, um, defined the behavioral strategy profile. So, so that's when the players can mixed uh, can mix certain actions uh, at a single state, right? So uh, here, by saying that the MP guaranteed to exist, uh, we're assuming that it's possible that the player would need to, at some point, mix their strategy. So there's this is a possibly behavioral strategy profile. That's the MP. How are we going to prove this? Um, the proof can actually be a reduction. Uh, to a normal form game. So searching for an MPE in the original Markov game would essentially be equivalent to searching for a normal form, uh, searching for NE, the Nash equilibrium in a normal form. And because the NE is guaranteed to exist, I mean, mixed NE is guaranteed to exist, uh, so MPE will definitely exist. So what we need is just to define this reduction. I'm going to um, quite you know, describe the reduction at a high level. Um, so we want to construct a normal form game. Of course, uh, we, we, we start with a Markov game with n players. So in the normal form game, we have to define the players. But we're going to expand the number of players in the normal form game. So what we do is for every player i and every state s, we can think of there's a new person who is playing in the role of player i at the state S, right? So in the Markov game, this player, um, there's one player who is uh, making decision at every state, right? Potentially at every state. Uh, but we can, uh, when we turn the whole situation into an equivalent normal form game, we can imagine that instead of just one player playing at every state, we're, we're essentially saying that there's actually a copy of this player at every state. And that copy of the player is making the decision there. Right. So essentially, we're going to have n multiplied by uh, the number of states, number of players in this new normal form game. Right. For every i and s, we're going to have a new player, which is denoted by bracket i s. Right. Uh, and then action space of this player will be exactly the same as the action space of player i. Right. And now what are the payoffs for this normal form game? Suppose these players take a certain action, which is the action profile uh, given. Uh, so basically, this will be the, the action for player IS. Right? Then the payoff to that player IS is defined in this way. So that will be the expected payoff 
out of any run or out of any play of the game which starts from um, the uh, current state S, uh, and then uh, the actions. Uh, so the the actions are uh, the, the the first action will be just the same as uh, what the sorry the, the the actions will be actually indicated by the corresponding action chosen by each of the players in the respective states right so r i s a and i'm using this r hat to denote the expected payoff for this normal form game uh given the action profile which i denote by a or arrow here uh so so given this the expected payoff will be equal to the expected payoff over all the plays that are sampled from the distribution determined by the current action profile of all of the players. Right. So uh, once we have this payoff, then we essentially get this new normal form game. And this normal form game I denoted by G hat. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, notice that G hat has the uh, Nash equilibrium. Uh, which I didn't know by pi hat, right? This pi hat indicates the action to be taken by every player of the game. And by every player, I mean actually every copy of the player in the original game, right? So for every IS, there is the um, action, which is the best response to all the other um, players' responses. <clears throat> then this pi hat will give rise to essentially a strategy profile in the original Markov game. Because once we uh, take all of the copy of the player, so that means for all of the state, we look at the uh, action taken by that player i, that copy of the player i, and then we assign it just back to player i. Right? This will uh, give us a strategy and, and also a Markov strategy for the Markov game. And I call this strategy pi i. Right, uh, and uh, we uh, want to prove that this pi i is in fact a best response to the opponent's strategy, and this can be easily done through proof by contradiction. Suppose suppose it is not a best response to the opponent's strategy, then you can find some action such that uh, for a certain for for this state s. Right, so suppose this is not a best response to the strategy at this state s, right? So you can at this state s, you can find an action such that the value to the player i at that state, if it plays this action instead of the previous strategy, uh, will be higher, right? So so we'll get a higher expected payoff. But this translates into the new normal form game that essentially we can get an action of one of the copies of player i uh, that gives this uh, player a higher payoff. Right? But that jeopardizes the assumption that the current strategy is a Nash equilibrium in this normal form game. So that won't happen. Right? And therefore, we can, through proof by contradiction, that this strategy that we obtain from the Nash equilibrium of this normal form game, that will be definitely a Markov perfect equilibrium of the original Bayesian, uh, of, of the original Markov game, right? So, so that's sort of, it, it, it takes a few slides to explain the proof, but actually it's, uh, the idea is relatively simple. In a single player game, uh, it is easy to ask what's the optimal response or uh, what's the optimal control of the player, right? But in a multi-stage game, we should give up on understanding just the optimal uh, situation because the people would just act in response to each other. And in fact, we're looking for the equilibrium, right? Um, so now the case is, uh, given a Markov game, we know that there is a Markov perfect equilibrium. Can we find one Markov perfect equilibrium? Right. I'm going to discuss this problem for a special type of game, namely two 
player zero sum Markov game. The previous example that we look at involving Mario and Bowser, that's a two player zero sum Markov uh, game, right? So, um, how do we find this? Remember, uh, so so this this problem itself actually is parallel to what well, actually it resembles the optimal control problem for MPEs, whereas in that situation, the single player wants to find the optimal control. But here, uh, we're just looking for the optimal responses of both players to each other. Right? So, so, so now we only have two players in this game. Um, but still, we can use a very similar uh, dynamic programming strategy, or sorry, a similar dynamic programming scheme to identify a strategy profile of the two players so that they uh, uh, best response to each other. Right? So, so how can we use uh, value iteration in this case? Uh, it needs a little bit of more background about zero-sum games. And this is something that I did not mention when I talk about normal form games. In fact, for zero-sum games, there's a very classical result by von Neumann, which is the Minimax theorem. And I think um, for a lot of you who may have done undergraduate artificial intelligence, you may um, already know about this theorem that says that whenever you have a zero sum normal form game, uh, then if you look at um, so the any mixed strategy of the player, so that you, you use alpha one to denote the mixed strategy of player one, and alpha two to denote the mixed strategy of alpha two, then the payoff to player one can be expressed by the multiplication of alpha one. So remember, alpha one being a mixed strategy you can represent it by a vector, right? It's a vector, the dimension of the vector will be uh, the number of actions uh, available to the players, right? Uh, alpha two also is a vector uh, whose dimension is the number of actions available to player two, right? And V is the payoff matrix. And because it's a zero sum game, we only look at the payoff matrix of one of the players, say player one. So, so now we get this matrix V, we got two vectors, alpha one, and alpha two, and V is actually a matrix whose dimension is the number of actions for player one multiplied with the number of uh, actions for player two, right? So now we can actually multiply alpha one transpose with V and then multiply alpha two, right? That resulting thing will be a single value, so it would be a scalar. And that would be the uh, expected payoff to player one, right? Um, so, so, so once we have this, then the minimax theorem says that now what we're doing is well, imagine that from the point of view of player one, player one definitely want to uh, have this value as large as possible because that's his expected payoff. But from the point of view of player two, player two definitely want to have this value to be as low as possible because it's a zero sum game, right? So we basically can look at the max min of this value where the max is ranging over all of the possible mixed strategies for player one and min is over all of the possible mixed strategy for player two. So the max min of this expected payoff by the von Neumann's minimax theorem, it's exactly the same as the min max of the same value. And min also is ranging over all of the player two's mixed strategy and max is over player one's strategies. So this means the max min correspond to min max, right? This is a uh, classical theorem by von Neumann. I'm not going to prove it, but there are plenty of proof online. Um, and then because of that, we could have the single value denoting the outcome of the game. That would be the maximum is the same as the min max, right, of this game, right, of, of this value. So that's the, uh, in, in the national equilibrium, that's the payoff to player one of the zero sum game. Right. Uh, consider, for an example, we have a zero sum game one, two, three, four. So this is only the payoff matrix for player one because the, for the player two, it would be just negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. And the Nash equilibrium can be represented by vector zero, one, and one, zero. Right. So this means that player one will only choose the second action, player two will only choose the first action. Right. And this, this gives uh, player one an expected payoff of three. 
and notice that uh, it, if you if you calculate these two values, you actually get the same value, which is three here. Right. So that is um, saying something about zero sum normal form games, and we're using VAL, so this function, val of a matrix M, right? This this M is the payoff matrix for player one. So val of this matrix to denote the natural equilibrium payoff of player one. So now we uh, we, we we define the value iteration algorithm for finding Markov perfect equilibria in a Markov game, and I called this algorithm Shapley uh, value iteration because it was first proposed by Shapley. Right, so now let uh, uh, m be the number of actions for player one, m be the number of actions for player two. We can now define a matrix, right, a, a matrix whose uh, parameters are a1, a2. So basically, this is an m by m matrix with rows corresponding to the action of uh, a1, uh, action of player one, and the column correspond to the actions of player two. Right, so for any action a1 of player 1 and a2 of player 2, we want to define the value. This will be corresponding to that location, that entry in the matrix. And what is that? So, so we denote this matrix by TV with a bracket S. So the, the S is a, it's an extra parameter, right? So essentially, this will be a matrix uh, but it's a matrix for any given state. So this means that for a different state, we're going to get a matrix, right? Um, so now this matrix will be defined in this way. Uh, for any A1 and A2, it will be equal to the probability of the transition from S to S prime of given the action A1, A2, multiply with the immediate payoff of that transition plus the discounted payoff at the next state. So gamma times V of S prime. And then altogether, this is multiplied by the probability, and this is summed over all of the possible um, next states. Right. So essentially, this uh, value will be the expected value, will be the expected value uh, under a current valuation function v. Uh, suppose we are starting the game at position s and suppose that the players adopt actions a1, a2. Right? So notice that this is sort of like the q function. This is sort of like the q function, right? Um, because in the Q function, in the MDP, we're starting from an S, which is a state, and then we're starting from a particular action. We want to evaluate the expected payoff for the player. But now we have two players, so we have actually two actions, A1 and A2, but assuming that starting from the uh, state S, and when the players uh, place A1 and A2, this value will be the expected payoff. Right, and and we do this for all the a1 and a2. This means that we actually obtain this m by m matrix, right? And now, uh, when we have this, essentially the 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 state action matrix, uh, we can of course obtain the Nash equilibrium for this zero sum game. You can remember, this would be a matrix, and it's a, it's a payoff matrix of a zero sum game. Right. And then, according to the mix, minimax theorem, we can obtain the value which corresponds to the uh, Nash equilibrium payoff for the first player. Right. Uh, and that value is, according to uh, our assumption, is when both players playing in an optimal strategy to each other uh, and uh, the payoff for player one. Right, so that is going to be our v star function. So this means that when both players are playing in their optimal strategy, so they enter into this interlocking position, then um, the value that the expected payoff for player one will be equal to the Nash equilibrium payoff for player one when they are actually playing uh, this normal form game at uh, state s. All right. So you can see that this is once again an recurrence relation. It expresses the value of V star as 
using the value of V star S. So we are entering into a very similar situation as in Markov decision process here. And uh, we got this recurrence relation, and that essentially can be used as a Bellman equation. We call this Bellman equilibrium, equilibrium value equation because it's expressing the value of players at an equilibrium of the game. Right? Um, so now it's quite easy for us to come up with the next theorem. And given a two player zero sum Markov game, a pair of Markov strategy is at Markov perfect equilibrium if and only if the payoff for the first player under this strategy pi will be equal to v star of s, right? This is the, the sort of like the optimal valuation function for every state s. Right, where V star is a unique solution to the Bellman uh, equilibrium value equation. So using this theorem, we can actually obtain a very similar algorithm at the value iteration, but to find Markov perfect equilibrium of a Bayesian game, uh, of a Markov game. So now we describe the value iteration algorithm for computing the equilibrium value function v star s. Uh, first of all, we would define the function v prime with a subscript k, uh, which is defined on any state s uh, as the uh, equilibrium value function of g for any place of length k starting from state s. So this is really uh, resembling the value iteration algorithm for MDP. So we have two uh, sort of uh, steps. So the, first of all, we have the iteration, and this is repeated uh, for arbitrary many times. For every state S, we can essentially compute this uh, matrix, which we defined in the last slide. But now this time, uh, we are given the uh, case value function that we have approximated. So that would be v prime with a subscript k. So given that, we can compute the matrix, uh, the payoff matrix that correspond to the state S. And this um, captures all of the expected payoff of the players if they adopt uh, actions A1, A2. Right. So we have, um, basically this can be computed using the value function vk prime. Right. And once we have this matrix, then we can apply the minimax theorem and then calculate the value of the zero sum game. Uh, so this is a two player static zero sum game, uh, that are having the payoff matrix as tvk prime bracket s, right? So this is, a particular um, uh, Nash equilibrium of this uh, normal form game, uh, and uh, the value capture the payoff to player one, right? And then uh, this value is now the new value for our uh, estimated value function, and then this will be the value of v uh, prime with the su subscript k plus one that's defin defined on the set S. So this will uh, allow us to update uh, the value function, uh, and then we iterate this process. Uh, when do we stop? We stop until the value function stabilizes. And at that moment, we say that, okay, the value function is converges, uh, and it uh, uh, actually outputs the uh, equilibrium value function, V star of S, right? So if we, uh, then we, we, we can uh, define what we call the optimal strategy profile for the player as a pair of Markov strategies, pi 1 star and pi 1, uh, pi 2 star, that uh, guarantees the both players a payoff of at least uh, V star of S from every state S. All right, so for, for player one, we can guarantee a payoff of V star S. For player two, we can guarantee a payoff of uh, at least a negative V star of S, right? Uh, and, and this uh, is optimal strategy profile. Actually, it's uh, the strategy profile which corresponds to the optimal action that could be made um, in response to uh, the opponent's action for every player, right? Uh, so that will give us essentially an MPE of the game.
right? Uh, and then uh, shaft value iteration is an algorithm that uses the value iteration that I described above to compute an optimal strategy of a two-player zero-sum Markov game. The um, algorithm can be quite easily described uh, here in um, this pseudo code. Initially, we start with allocating zero to all of the value function vs. So that's the sort of the initial uh, phase for this value function, and then we go on to describe uh, the iterations. So in each iteration, we define this matrix T S uh, as uh, what I just described, right? So this is a matrix with parameters uh, a1, a2, where a1 is an uh, action of player 1, and a2 is an uh, action of player 2. And then uh, after we computed this matrix, we can then use it as the payoff function of a zero-sum game, and then compute the value uh, that uh, corresponds to the play player 1's uh, payoff. And that would be the new value for the valuation function Vs. Right? So this is my V prime S. So after the convergence, we'll actually get the equilibrium valuation function V. And once this is done, then what we do is we just need to uh, go through another loop uh, for every state. We want to uh, identify the optimal strategy of the players. And this can be done by uh, looking at the current uh, matrix. So this matrix, again, is sort of like the Q value function, right? This is this T matrix, the TS matrix. It's sort of like the the, the, the Q value function, right? So for every state and for every pair of strategies A1 and A2, it evaluates the expected payoff to the player. Suppose that they adopt A1 and A2 at the stage S, at the state S, right? Uh, and then uh, after that, we can uh, uh, compute uh, a pair of mixed strategies, alpha one and alpha two, that correspond to the players, so player one's and player two's uh, actions, such that uh, these mixed strategies will actually indeed correspond to the value of these uh, of this uh, zero sum game defined by T S. Right? And this can be done by essentially applying the minimax theorem. And then after that, we just say that okay, at this particular state S. Uh, player 1's optimal strategy will be to play the mixed strategy alpha 1, and player 2's optimal strategy will be to play uh, alpha 2. Right? And that's just identification of this uh, optimal strategy for the players. Right? So that's Shapley value iteration. Uh, so basically what we have covered in this lecture is we extended the notion of Markov decision process from last lecture to the case when we have multiple players and what we get there would be a Markov game uh, and uh, then uh, we will stay uh, talking about just Markov strategy this will be strategy that only rely on the current state of the game and based on the current state the act the 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 players uh, according to the strategy will choose a particular action uh, and uh, we've looked at uh, the corresponding solution concept, which is the sort of counterpart to uh, subgame perfect equilibrium, but for Markov game, and this would be Markov perfect equilibrium. And uh, then we'll look at the uh, problem of finding MPE in a Markov game. We know that MPE will always exist for for any Markov game, uh, and then we would just want to find it, but we solve this problem for, in particular, two-player zero-sum Markov game, and we actually adopt a strategy that's very similar to uh, value iteration. We call it Shapley value iteration, in this case, to find the optimal strategies of the players for this type of game. All right, so that finishes today's lecture, uh, and I will see you in the next lecture.